Premier Rockets podcast. It's H-Town Hoops, hosted by Brandon Scott and Adam Spolane. Welcome into the H-Town Hoops podcast here with Brandon Scott, Adam Spillane, Austin Mendez handling things for us behind the scene. And we are here to discuss a few things. We've got the trade deadline is just a few weeks away. The Rockets just came off of a road trip that was, let's call it less than successful. They only won one game. What was it? One and four, one and five. One and five. Uh, one and five on the road uh, in this road trip coming back home. And uh, it, it was a regression. There's there's no other way to put it. You, you lose, you know, five of six. The only win comes against a lowly Detroit team, and it's at the end of the game. And you had, and Detroit had a chance to win that game, you know. So you could have gone zero uh, and six, and one of those losses could have been to the worst team in the league. Adam, I'll give you the floor on this. There's a lot of things to get into, but I'll give you the floor in terms of what was the source of this road trip regression for the Rockets. Oh, well, it's not just the road trip. It's really been this last almost month, and it's been the defense. I mean, it's really that simple. And I know people have pointed to the offense because offense is the easiest thing to point to. But from the start of the season to Christmas, the Rockets were 15 and 12 with a 113 offensive rating and a 109.5 defensive rating. Since Christmas, they are 4 and 9. The offensive rating has dropped from 113 to 112.8. That's a basically a basket per that, that's a basket essentially. But the defensive rating has gone from 109.5 to 118.6. It is as simple as it has all been about the defense. The defense has fallen off the cliff. Uh, part of that is three-point luck. They, they, you know, the Chicago Bulls, a team that does not make a lot of threes, killed them with three-pointers um, in Chicago last week. Um, the Boston Celtics, who are a great three-point shooting team, they were a great three-point shooting team on Saturday in Boston. Um, so there's been some three-point luck. It's also been the fact that they've been without two of their best defenders for a good portion of this time. You know, not having Tari East and not having Dylan Brooks has really hurt them. And so the other guys just haven't been good enough. Uh, so it, it really, to me, it has been all about the defense during this stretch. And even Detroit. I mean, Detroit scored 110 points against them. I mean, that's the sort of stuff that you never thought would have happened before Christmas. That's how good the defense was. The defense is what carried them. The defense is what has fallen off. Yeah, and we've talked uh, plenty about how this team lacks shooting, like the holes in this team, even though it's a better team, even though they've addressed a lot of issues. The one thing that they don't have is a lot of shooting. So you can expect for the Rockets to have nights where they're just not putting the ball in the basket because they're somewhat of an offensively challenged team. And especially, and we'll talk about Jalen Green. We'll talk about some of these other guys to help the Tar East. And like you mentioned, but like they don't, they don't have go-to scoring Outside of, you know, Shingoon, and, and we can even talk about him, but they don't really have much go-to scoring or knockdown shooting. And so the success that they've been having, as you mentioned, the success they've been having early on in the season was tied to their defense. And, and a lot of the offense um, could even be created by that through uh, through playing defense. Do you buy into – I know M.A. Udoka mentioned that it's a – that it's a, a it's been a toughness issue uh, that they've taken a step back in just how I, I guess how tough and how aggressive they've been in games like do you think that's it to me it's been more of what you said to in your last statement there it was more of a, a a talent thing when you lose one of your better two of your better defenders arguably your two best defenders on the perimeter and it's not you know it's not going the way that it had been going before like, is this an effort issue? It's a, I've, I've been seeing a lot of M.A. Udoka criticism, Adam, on the Internet, but that's on the Internet. What, what do you what do you actually think that this is? Uh, I just think they aren't defending at the, at the same level that they were earlier in the season. And they've gotten a little bit unlucky. The schedule has gotten a lot tougher. I mean, they are having to play. They, they played a back to back last weekend. They play another back to back. I mean, they, they all of a sudden. They had a lot of practice time early in the year, just with the way their schedule was. And for a time, they had played the fewest games in the league. And that has come back the other way. And now they aren't having any practice time. Like, they are going to practice today. I believe that might be the second time in the last two weeks that they've actually had practice time. They have been they had been a very healthy team for the start of the season. Their starting lineup had, had started every single game all but once before Christmas. Then Dylan Brooks gets hurt. Now all of a sudden, starting lineup hasn't been quite, you know, they haven't had that same sort of consistency. So I just think it's normal ups and downs of an NBA season. Um, 
so that's all I think it is. Like, I, I don't think like there's like, I know it's very trendy to blame the coach. Trust me. I, I covered this team for the last however many years. And the first thing that people do is they blame the coach. I mean, it, it, I get it. It's easy, but that's not the problem. The problem it's about the players. The players are the ones who have to play. The players are the ones that have to ask that have to execute. And if they don't do it, they're not going to win games. The toughness part of it. I don't see it quite that way. Just because when I think of toughness, I think about rebounding. And even during this 13 game stretch, they've been okay when it comes to rebounding. They're seventh in defensive rebounding rate. And I know that's not the be all end all, but to me, that's a pretty good measure of just like your overall physicality. But I, this is what, this is who Ime Udoka is. Ime Udoka is a hard nosed guy. He wants his teams to be the more physical team. And uh, so I can sort of see why he thinks the way that he thinks, but I don't really think that's been an issue. I just think that they've, they just haven't been playing well. They've been a little. They've been injured, and the schedule has kind of caught up with them. And they're not. Yeah, the- yeah I, I agree with that. I, I watch, and I don't look at them and think, "Hey, this is a poorly coached team." And, and part of that is being familiar with the team and knowing the pieces that are missing. So you're like, "Okay, this is a team that relies on defense." Dylan Brooks isn't out there. All right, so they're not as good as on defense. This is a team that relies on. Energy. You did a good job, I thought, of pointing out how much better on SportsRadio610.com, how much better the Rockets are with Tari Eason on the floor, or maybe, maybe more succinct or more pronounced, how much worse they are without him um, at times. And, and so, like, you look at it, it's like, I don't know how, I don't know how you could trot out a roster that has no shooting, very little shooting, and then the identity of the team is supposed to be defense and you take out two of its better defenders and you start talking about how the coach is doing a bad job. Yeah. Like, like, like to me, and this isn't necessarily to even defend MA Udoka, but it's more so to have like a clear picture of what exactly is wrong with the team. They, they can't, sh- that, that's the frustrating part about it. It's not the coach. It's that, man, you don't really feel like you've got, and, and we've talked about it a lot but you don't have a lot of knockdown shooting and you're starting to build your team around, you know, a post player, a big, and you just kind of got a a bunch of guys out there who are hitter, who are very much hit or miss. Brandon, it's a team that the last three years won 17 games, 20 games in 22 games. They have a chance to get win number 20 at the halfway point tomorrow night. I mean, and we're going to complain about the coaching. I mean, come on. There's, there are, there are issues. Certainly, the roster, it's not a great roster. Like, I think we all knew this coming into the season. It's not a great roster. It's a young roster. They they finally added some – it's a much better roster than what they've had. But this isn't like a 40, 50, 60 win – I mean, it might be a 40 win roster. They're kind of on pace for that. But it's still like a 50 or 60 win roster. Like, you can't expect this roster to go into Boston on the second night of a back-to-back three games and four nights and win that game. And then go into Philly 36 hours later and win that game. Like, they are they aren't as good as a lot of the teams that they're playing. That's why I was a little iffy on whether or not they would hit that 32 and a half number that we talked about before the season that they're uh, they're Vegas over under just because all these teams in the league are really good. And you're seeing it now in the West as we, we have a, as, as we've you know basically hit the halfway point. It's going to be really difficult for them to make the play in and about everything that has gone right for them has gone right. They've been, for the most part, they've been really healthy. Their best player has been Alperin Shingun. He's been healthy. He's played every single game. Fred Van Vliet's probably been their second best player. He's played all but one game. So, I, I mean, a, a lot, they had a, a very uh, generous schedule with all the home games early on. They can't win on the road. That's been an issue. You just saw that going one and five on a road trip and the one win comes against the, what, what are they, a four win team now in Detroit. So this is kind of what they are. The fact that the fact that we are sitting here on January nineteenth, about to be at the halfway point, and they're nineteen and twenty one, they have exceeded a lot of expectations. And I, and I get that people want more, and people want to see them, you know, make a make a run in in the play in or maybe even the playoffs. But you got to understand where this team is right now, and for them to get to that next level. They need some of these young guys to step up because Van Vliet has done his part. Dylan Brooks has done his part when he's been out there. But they and I know we're going to get to him, but they need Shengun to be able to, to stay at the level that he was at early in the year. Uh, and they and Jabari Smith, they need to for him to continue to play the way that he's played because he's just been tremendous lately. And then they need Jalen Green to show a little bit, show much, much more than what he's shown through the first three. Really, the last 24 games for Jalen Green have been really, really not good. 
Yeah. Oh, oh, we we are definitely going to get to Jalen Green. Let's so so we we agree that the coaching is not the issue. It's so it's a player thing. So let's yeah, get to the it's players. Always a, for for me. Listen, I don't know how it is for everybody else, but for me, it's always about the players. The players win games. The players lose games. The coaches are to me. The coaching is a very minor aspect of this thing. Yeah, in, in basketball specifically, like when we're talking about hoops. I, I 100% agree with you. I think coaching matters probably more than anything in football, but in, in basketball, man, you got to go out there and play. You got to go out there and do your thing. Uh, so let's get to the players. You mentioned Jalen Green. We'll get to him in a second. But Alperin Shingun, been their best player, but hasn't necessarily played like, you know, let's call it the best player on a winning team, which is what they want to be. And he is their best player. So by, you know, by extension, he would be the best player on the winning team. He has not played that way necessarily over the last few games. And even then, he's put up some numbers, but they're not – like, they're not great. What would you say is the source of his struggles over the last few games and why he's not playing at that all-star level? The way we were talking about him a week ago when we were saying he was making a – restating his case for, for an all-star appearance and the guy that they're building around over the past week or so, it hadn't necessarily looked like that. I mean, this might be too easy of an excuse, but the schedule has not been easy. Like, you just look, and let's see, in Detroit, he scores uh, – he had a good game in Detroit. He, he scored 29 in Detroit, 25 in Chicago, in an yep. overtime game where he played 41 minutes. Then he's got to go to Boston, second night of a back-to-back after playing 37 minutes and 41 minutes in, what, a 72-hour uh, stretch. That, of course, wasn't going to go well. Um and then 36 hours later, he's got to turn around and play in Philly against Joel Embiid. That didn't go well. And then they played poorly. The, the whole team wasn't very good in New York. Um, I don't think that he's been, like, awful. Like, I'm just you, – you go by the numbers and, you know, 7 for 16, 7 for 15. Okay, it's not the most efficient, but he's getting to the line. Um, the rebounding's been okay. Um, so he had four blocks in New York. That's not something that you would have expected. I think he's been okay. I just think – Again, like with a lot of like with the with the group as a whole, the schedule caught up with them. It's just I, I, people don't understand just the grind of a six game road trip. I just did three games, and it was a grind, including the back to back. I did the back to back Detroit to Boston. That was not fun. And, and you didn't uh, play. And you didn't no, play. No, I, I didn't. I didn't play. <laughs> uh, and actually, um, they got in. So the weather in Detroit last Friday was just awful, and it was snow and slush and ice and everything. So the game in Detroit ends. I would say I think they probably left the arena maybe at 1030 and the flight to Boston's an hour and a half. They did not get to the hotel in Boston until about 430 in the morning. Like they had to sit on the tarmac in Detroit for a long time just to even take off. So like that trip, I think, was a little bit more of a grind than people knew at the time. So just a six game trip, it, it catches up with you. And again, they haven't had any practice time. Um, the way that the back-to-backs have, have just been coming at them left and right lately. And again, part of that is the schedule that they had early in the year. Part of that is the way that the, the league made the schedule to to for the in-season tournament where the whole league is going through like a nine-day stretch and playing two games. I mean, that, that wasn't good for anybody. I think when we get to the in-season tournament, like they can't be doing that because now all of a sudden that's probably two back-to-backs that got added to the schedule just for that. So I don't think a whole lot of you know the recent struggles for him. I just think it's it's part of the grind of an NBA season and a six game road trip with their when there are back to backs and then a game at one o'clock thirty six hours later after the back to back that's going to happen sometimes. Yeah, I, I I don't think he's been great over the last however long it's been like last eight games he's had and I don't I don't put too much in the plus minus but he's had. It's been pl- on the positive side of plus minus once over the last eight games that they played in the last two weeks. And it was that game that you were talking about where he's got the uh, he's got the 29 against against Detroit. But I, I would say this, though, this is kind of a credit to him and maybe even a, a credit to him and maybe a criticism of the roster. But even in the midst of his quote unquote struggles, as he hasn't looked great, per se, he's still clearly been the best player on their team. Like at, at no point when he's like not played well or up to whatever standard we were trying to set uh, on him being, you know, a potential all-star and all of that. At no point throughout that have I watched him and said, or have I questioned, okay, is he the best player on the team? No, he still is. He's just, like you said, going through a brutal part of the schedule. And, you know, I I think there is something to, 
you know, learning about this Rockets team, right? Like it's still, it's still kind of a project. And I think the, you know, the league is sort of catching on. They, not that, you know, Shingun's in his third season, people are aware of what his skills are, but in terms of how it fits on this team and what this team wants to do, I think it's pretty clear that he's their best player, that he's the one who the offense is going to run through. And I think that, you know, the, the assignments are going to become harder because of that. Like he's going to have, rougher nights the with with all of this recognition you know the whole with great power comes great responsibility cliche like i think there's something to that like the better he gets the rougher it's going to get on him on a night in night out basis especially when the schedule starts to kind of grind out the way you the way you describe it well he's also going to be at the top of everybody's scouting report Right. Like I think before teams were like, hey, Jalen Green is the number one option. We've got to take him out. No, now it's going to be Shingun. And Shingun is going to be that top option. And the minutes are going to continue to pile up for him. And that's one of the things that I'm really interested to see is how does he handle playing 38 minutes a game? This year he is at 32 minutes a game, which is up from 28. See, he was He's at 32.3 last year. He's at, he, or he's at 32.3 this year. He was at 28.9 last year. Um, he's playing every single game. He's playing a lot of minutes. There are nights where he does not come out with the necessary energy. Like you look at the game in Chicago. He scored 25 points in that game. All 25 were after halftime. And basically, Ime Yudoka said, yeah, he, he didn't play the first half. And they ripped into him a little bit. So I think that's the thing that he's got to do a better job of is that when you're the best player, you have to bring that energy from tip-off to the final buzzer. And I think there are times when he doesn't do that. But overall, I think he's been fine. And uh, like, like you said, he's probably been their best player over this, this uh, even in this bad stretch. So I, I, I don't think – it's kind of like the coaching with me. I, I don't I don't see it necessarily as Shingun struggles. I don't necessarily see – I don't see it at all as a coaching problem. I just think it's, it's been one of those one of those stretches. And, you know, they, they were off on Thursday. They practiced today. So I, I'm guessing it's probably going to be a pretty light practice today. And then you go into another back to back <laughs> and then you got, but they got two days off. So the game that I'm really interested to see, I'm really interested to see how they come out tomorrow against Utah. Um, the, again, having to play Boston on a back to back twice is just awful. I don't really know why the league did t- decided to do that to them, but that's what the schedule is. But then they've got a couple off days on Monday and Tuesday. And then Wednesday uh, they play Portland. I think to me, that's the game where you really want to see them be really good as that Portland game, because they will, ha- they will have had some rest. They will have had a little bit of practice time. That's, in, in all honesty, that's basically a schedule win. We talk about schedule losses all the time. Portland with two off days is a schedule win. Hey, I'm, I'm not going to even lie to you, Adam. I think I had kind of erased, and we've already, we'd actually mentioned it earlier in the show, but then you mentioned it again, the Chicago game. <laughs> I think I'd kind of erased that from my memory uh, because that that was brutal. And, and you mentioned this, but – they allow Chicago to play a brand of basketball that they don't even play uh, in terms of the three point shooting. Maybe you call it an anomaly, but that 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 was the one that stood out. I know we're going to look ahead here, but since you did mention it, I guess the the most disappointing part about this stretch, this one in five road trip, and you mentioned it, it's been a bad, uh, not so great month, so to speak, for the for the Rockets. But it was that. Bulls, Pistons, I know those weren't back-to-back, but those were the consecutive games. I thought those were the two games that you'd come out of it and be the most disappointed of because the Bulls, it's not that you're above losing to the Bulls who aren't a good, a very good basketball team, but it was the way you lost, and then you, I, I just don't think you can have that against Detroit um, to almost lose to them or to play the way that they played against those two teams. Um, I, I think those are the two that stand out. And, and, and Chicago, for whatever reason, is one that I even tried to erase from my memory bank. Well, let's look at the six games real quick. Miami, nothing wrong with losing in Miami. Right. Chicago, Detroit, we talked about those. Losing in Boston the second night of a back-to-back, no big deal. Losing in Philly 36 hours after a back-to-back, no big deal. Losing to the Knicks, no big deal. Like You're going to lose those games. Right. Um, the Chicago game, you cut you, – you, they played the way that you wanted. Like they wanted Chicago to shoot threes. Chicago has been a bad three point shooting team for a long time. The Rockets wanted them to shoot threes, and the Bulls made more threes in the first half than they do in a game that night. And then um, 
the three stopped going in and it gave the Rockets a chance to come back. And they, they probably should have won that game in overtime. And then all of a sudden the bulls hit three straight threes and they, and they turn a, a four point Rockets lead or a five point Rockets lead into a four or five point bulls. lead. I mean, that that's just how quick it happened. And then I, I do think that there was some carryover into that Detroit game where all these guys played 40 plus minutes. They got to go play a bad Detroit team and just being in the arena, there might've been a thousand people in that arena for that game. Like it was empty. The weather was terrible. It's a bad team. They're all, all they care about right now is, is the lions and no energy in the arena, in the arena, no juice. And they got off to a bad start and they kind of, they could never sustain anything. It was Jalen green, you know, kept them alive in the first half. And then it was Shane June keeping them alive in the second half and, and they stole a win. So that's a really, listen, I, I know people look at an Eastern conference road trip. and say, Oh, it's no big deal. It's the Eastern conference. They played good teams in the Eastern Conference. Like I think there's – let me look really quick. Obviously, you have to take Detroit out of out of the mix, but I think the other five teams that they played on that trip will either be – or are probably competing yeah. for for the playoffs. So, I yeah. Think the is the, the, one the team. Bulls – yeah, yeah, I was going to say, the Bulls aren't good, man. They, but they are uh, – Boston is one. Philly is three. New York is five. Miami is six. And then Chicago, who's probably playing better – who is playing – probably about as well as a playoff team right now, they're still in the play-in if the season ended today. So it's not like they played the dregs of the Eastern Conference on this trip. Yeah. There was no Charlotte, aside from Detroit. There was no Charlotte. It's not like they had a back-to-back in Charlotte and Washington. Like, that would have been nice. I think they probably would have won those games. Yeah, Sh- Chicago is the team I would say is most comparable to your own if you're a Rockets fan. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I, I think that, that, that Chicago's more like a peer. I'm kind of poking fun a little bit at Chicago because I think the difference – I would say this. The difference is Chicago. I don't feel like Chicago. I mean, I know Kobe White's playing better, but they don't really have a young crop of talent where they're like, oh, this is what our future looks like. They're trying to figure out how do we get from this Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan era and, and like that's not really going anywhere. Whereas I think the Rockets at the very least have a young, promising player in Shingoon. They've got. Uh, Tari Eason again, who we'll talk about in a little bit, and, and Jabari Smith. I, I mentioned Tari Eason before Jabari Smith. Jabari Smith Jr., who has been, I think, really, really good. And if he's like, if this is where he's trending, if like if he's like on a, you know, trending upward, I think you got to really feel feel good about that. But let's get into this Jalen Green thing because you wrote on SportsRadio610.com. I referenced this earlier, and I'm encouraged the audience to go check it out on sportsradio610.com. Adam wrote on the three biggest questions facing the Rockets in the season's second half. And obviously they're going to reach the second half by Saturday uh, or by the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. So Sunday will be the first game of the second half of the season. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's how, how that works. Yes. So, so you wrote on this, the three biggest questions, one of them, and I think chief among them because of, the draft status and really just the conversation is what is Jalen Green? And, and they're going to be trying to figure that they've been trying to figure that out. <laughs> We've talked about it to death, man. It's been a disappointing year, been a disappointing year three. Um, he, he is at times indecisive. He made Udoka has talked about him, not necessarily uh, reading things properly or trusting what he sees. Um, I, I know there's an issue of like, you know, his, his shot selection isn't great. His actual shot isn't great, but he's got this otherworldly ability that you still see, even in his struggles. You're like, well, there's only a few guys who can move like that and who have the these type of physical traits, or like this is an elite physical ability, physical trait, but it doesn't like translate into like elite basketball play. It's like average at best. And then sometimes, as we've talked about, and maybe the worst, this is when it's at its worst, is when you don't notice him out there. It's when he's just playing and he's just a guy out there. And, and at no point should he just be a guy. Where are we on this question going into the second half of the season of what is Jalen Green? I mean, I don't think for these last 42 games, anybody has more on the line than Jalen Green just because of being extension eligible after the season. And you've seen what guys in that previous draft class got. I mean, we're talking – 200 million, 250 million, like that stuff is out there for him. If he is, if he shows that he can be that type of guy, he hasn't been so far this season. And and we talk about the Rockets poor three point shooting. You look at just the starting five uh, and and that's who Alperin Chingun is playing with most of the time. 
Fred Van Vliet, 39.4% from three. That's after a downturn over the last week. He was over 40% last week. Jabari Smith Jr., 37.6%. Dylan Brooks, 40%. Obviously, he's missed a bunch of time lately. But then you have Jalen Green at 33.1%. And the, over the last 24 games, it's at 318 Like, just the last we, – we, I think we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but – Jalen Green's first 16 games are pretty good. Like it wasn't the most efficient scoring that I'd ever seen, but it was pretty good. And the last 24 have been really a struggle. And he's not shooting the ball well, 38% from the field. Uh, his free throw shooting has gone down. or not Like he's not getting to the line nearly as much as he did. And you saw this. You look at just like the game log. There are games where he doesn't shoot the ball well, but it still looks okay because he's able to get to the free throw line. He's just not doing that consistently enough. They tried it early in the year where he would be with the bench unit, and that didn't work. And so now lately it's been Jabari, it's been Jabari Smith Jr., although um, with Dylan Brooks, I think that'll probably change a little bit. So it's just they need him. This has been a bad offense. This has been a bottom 10 offense for most of the season, really the entire season. How do you fix that? You have your you have your the guy who's supposed to probably be your best scorer. He's got, he if he's more efficient, then all of a sudden you can easily get into the top half. Like it's that simple for them. If Jalen Green goes from you know shooting forty percent to to forty three percent, and you know from thirty three percent from three to thirty five percent from three, like these are incremental uh, these are incremental improvements. Then you, I think you could probably easily get into the top half in in terms of offensive efficiency, but. That's what they've got to figure out over these last 40 games or 42 games. Is he somebody that we are really going to commit to moving forward? Now, they don't have to do anything. Like They can just say, just play it out. Play out the rookie deal, and we'll see what happens when you're a restricted free agent after next season. But I don't know if you want a guy – that's that's asking a lot of a guy to, to go into a contract year, especially a young guy like that where that might be – all he's thinking about. So it's it's a it's a difficult situation that he's in that they're in, but he's he's just got to play better. Like it's really that simple. And there are times when I'm telling you, there are times when he just flashes. And that the second quarter that he had in Detroit, where they're down 12, and all of a sudden he scores 16 points in the blink of an eye, and they get t- they get to they're tied at halftime. All of a sudden, like that shows you what he can be. And then he had a pretty decent third quarter. He scores eight in the third quarter, and then the fourth quarter he just fell off a cliff again. So you're like, you just need some consistency, not just game to game, but just quarter to quarter, half to half. And I think if you can get that from him, um, he could be really good. Like they try early in games to get him going. And like, it, it always does seem to be a focus early in the game. Hey, let's make sure let's get Jalen the ball. Let's get him some shots and you hope that they fall. But it's just, it's just been one of those really strange things where it just hasn't been as good as you expected it to be. And it seemingly is not getting better as the season goes along. Again, there are. I talked to Fred Van Vliet about this, and Fred told me just how proud he is of of uh, of Jalen and how he's played this season. But you know, there are certainly things that he is better at. But I don't think that you have seen the improvement that I think that you were hoping to see at this point. Yeah, man, you you pointed out a couple of things in your piece that that I want to point out here for the audience uh, in terms of his numbers. And through 40 games, he's shooting 40 cent, 40% from the field, 40.1%. That's down from 41.6% last season. His three-point shooting, pretty much right around the same, but down a little bit from last season, but, but basically right around 33 34% from three. The free throws, though, because we talked about this last year about his – you know, one of the things that he was improving at, one of the things that he's was really good at it last year, man, it was encouraging about his game because here's where I'm at with it, Adam. I've come to him based off of these numbers that we just that you wrote about and that I just spelled out for the audience. I have accepted that Jalen Green, at least right now, you know, it's going to take a while to develop if it's ever going to happen. But right now, Jalen Green is not a a great three point shooter. He's not a great shooter, period, like just pure shooting. Now, shot making is something that you think he could figure out because of his ability, his physical ability, but just knockdown shooting. I'm not expecting his three point numbers to be above what they are necessarily. I'd like for him to be, but I'm not expecting it. I've kind of accepted that this is basically what he is. Well, if you're going to take six and a half a game, you got to be better than 33 percent. I, I, I understand that. I understand yeah. he absolutely need, he needs to be better. But but Adam. It's year three. That jumper, it, it looks a lot like still like it did when he was a rookie. And it's just not a great shot. 
for him. And it may, so maybe the answer there is to take fewer. But I don't I don't love that either because it's the modern NBA. And if you're a high volume scorer, you need to be able to at least like shoot threes at a respectable clip. I, I get that. But I go back to this free throw thing. You know, like I, I keep going back to that to go down. And I don't know if I said this number yet, but this is the one you wrote. And, and folks can go look this up. It's down from six point one free throw attempts per game last season through 40 games or to 40 games this season. It's down to four point six attempts. So from 6.1 free throw attempts last season, now down to 4.6 attempts. Now, we've got explanations and reason for that. Personnel has changed. Coaching has changed. Philosophy a little bit has changed. But as you mentioned, they are making a conscious, concerted effort to get him involved early in these games. And really, for the type of ability he has, he should be somebody who's getting involved late in games, when they need a closer, when they need some, when they need a rally. You know, when they need buckets, he's at the very least supposed to be the guy who goes out there and gets you a bucket. That's why it was so discouraging when when we saw him getting benched in the fourth quarter, you know, or, or not playing down late down the stretch in certain games. Like it's like, man, well, this you're an offensively challenged team. And it is in part because you're be, who the guy who's supposed to be your best offensive player just simply is not. And, and in some cases is not really reliable. So like this is you said something to the effect earlier of nobody's got more on the line in the second half of the season than Jalen Green. I agree. I would I would take it from this perspective from like and I, I think fans, I think most fans would agree with me on this. He is the most. Like. The in terms of the emotional investment in, in a player and in the team. He is the guy that is most frustrating and infuriating because you feel like if it does click, we're talking about this from a contract standpoint, right? Like, is he is he going to get the max contract? Is he not? Are they just going to wait and play it out? But what does that all really mean for the team and for the experience of watching the team? It means, hey, you've got a guy that you can rely on in the fourth quarter, that you can rely on night in and night out to get you. 25 or whatever it is that he's supposed to be out there scoring and man the idea that you'd go from you know number two pick and he was bold that night when he was drafted you know talking about the things that he wanted to accomplish max contract he even mentioned that on draft night which i didn't think was a great idea but he even mentioned that and to go from that to hey by the time he gets to year four it's like what you said Oh, just play out the contract and see how it goes and see how he's playing. Like that is that is incredibly disappointing, Um, not only for him, but for, again, the experience of watching the team. Like you just you you expect a lot more from a guy, not just that's drafted that high, but but shows the flashes that you and I are talking about. No, like you thought that because it's not like it's not there at all. It's not like it's just like a complete whiff and it's not there at all. Right. You see some flashes. You thought by the halfway point of year three that you'd know what he is at this point. And it felt like you did after the first two seasons. Like, you know, rookie season was rough as rookie seasons are, but he was really good by the end of it. Uh, Last year, again, some inconsistencies, but there were, again, there were those flashes where he could score 40 in a night. And this year it's just, it just hasn't clicked for him. Um, Again, there are, there are those moments, but he isn't doing the things that I think that you like, he, he's become a better playmaker. He's become a better defender. Like that's good. Like that, that's, that's good. And, and you need that sort of stuff to, to improve. That's just kind of normal type of development, but they drafted him to be a scorer. They drafted him to score 25 a game. Basically that's the type of guy that they thought they were getting. And it's just not there. And what is he at 17 a game right now? And yeah, that's just, just yeah. that, that's not, I don't think that's what they thought they were getting at with the second pick in the draft. Now, again, he's still, he's, he, he's still, he's only 21. Like he'll be 22 in what a month or two. So like, there's still a lot of time for him to figure this out and to be the type of player that they thought he was going to be. But he's, I don't know, something's got to click. I don't know what it is. You know, you, you thought that if anybody that a new staff could maybe get it out of him and get some consistency out of him, I mean, it, it's been weird just because he hasn't been. I, I, I'm sure it's been an adjustment for him because 
under the previous regime, he was the guy. He was the guy who had the ball a lot. He was the guy who the offense was kind of centered around. And now all of a sudden this year, it's centered around Chingun and it's centered around, you know, it's Van Vliet who, who's touching the ball more. Like his touches have gone way down this season. And I think that he's got to try and maneuver that. Uh, and it, it hasn't been easy. Like it, this is a tough league. Like this league is really, really difficult. And some guys progress faster than others. So I, I don't know exactly what he is at this point. I don't know what he could be. But I do think that for them moving forward, like they've got to, that's, I think that's probably the biggest thing that they've got to figure out is what do they have in him? And it's, it's tough. It's a, it's a really tough aspect of, of just what this season has been, because I, I really think that they thought that he would take that leap this year. And so far it just hasn't happened on a consistent basis. All right, man, we're recording on a tight schedule. We'll probably get into the trade deadline next week when we record, but we had to get this episode in, man, had to talk about these Rockets. Before we get out of here, man, let's let's hit on Tari Eason, man. Dude's missed nine games. He's got a leg issue. I, I'm going to be honest, man. You, you're way more connected and, and understand this better than I. What is up with Tari Eason's leg? Like, what's, what's the matter with him, man? And, and when can we – when might we expect him to come back? We've already talked about – or I mentioned it earlier, the – how critical it is for him to be out there, how different of a team they are with and without him. What exactly is the deal with that? So if you remember, he had a stress reaction in his left leg during training camp. And so that's why he missed the first six games of the season. He came back and he was on a minute restriction for basically the entire season. Uh, but he was always popping up on the injury report. And it was always yeah, every single day, like you could set your watch to it. He would pop up on the injury report. He would always essentially be a game time decision. And, uh, he would he played most of the time, but again, he was on a minute restriction. I think he has he's played in 22 of 40 games, but he's only eclipsed the 30 minute mark once. And I believe he's only eclipsed 25 minutes in seven of those 22 games. And then finally, uh, it was right after Christmas, they basically stopped playing him. And but they were still kind of going on a game to game basis. So he was still showing up on the injury report as questionable before games. And then in Chicago, um, Ime Yudoka said that he, they were going to essentially reevaluate him in one to two weeks. And so it basically, I asked Yudoka this before they went on the road. It's like, how do you get past these leg issues? And he basically said, well, he needs to rest. And then all of a sudden, they essentially shut him down for at least a couple of weeks. So I think that they are hopeful that this time off will probably not solve everything, but just make it a little bit better to where he's not on the injury report. Because another thing that Yudoka said – was that while Eason was playing, he was he was playing with more pain than I think that he was letting on. And so that's never a good thing because you want players to be honest with you. You want players to tell you, hey, man, I'm really hurt because if you don't, then that's how things get worse. So I think that they are hoping and we'll have to wait and see. Um, we are it's 940 in the morning. Well, you know, the injury report, they practice late this afternoon, uh, so we won't know anything about about his status for um, Saturday's game until late this afternoon, a few hours from now. But I imagine they are going to be very careful with him because um, first of all, stress reactions are that that's nothing to joke about. Uh, and that, that's nothing to, uh, you know, like those things can, can be really bad for you. And that, that can force you to, to miss a lot more time than he's already missed. And like you said, they have been a different team without him. Uh, they are a different team when he's on the floor. Like he's just so disruptive. He helps. He helps on both ends of the floor. Uh, they have been an elite defense when he's out there, and he helps get them easy opportunities on offense because of his ability to force turnovers. So they need him. They need his shooting also. Like we we've talked about the three point shooting. He's a thirty six percent three point shooter. So you look, and Dylan Brooks is a forty percent free throw shooter. He missed a bunch of time. Easton's at thirty six percent. He's missed a bunch of time, and they really don't bring anybody off the bench. That three can three point. Three three yeah. point. I mean, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you said uh, you said Dylan Brooks was forty percent free throw. You meant three, but uh, you meant three. Bad, yeah, no, no I, was, I was making. I didn't want people to be confused in what you were saying. But but go go ahead. But even like Aaron Holiday was coming off the bench and shooting well from three. That's disappeared. He's I think he's at thirty percent over the last however many games, uh, at least since January. Jay Sean Tate's not shooting the ball at all. He's at thirty percent from three for the year. So uh, Jeff Green's at 32 percent for the year from three. So like they have some three point shooting. It's just all in the starting lineup right now. Uh, and so they need an average three-point shooter in Eason to come off their bench and to at least help in that regard. So I, I don't know when he's going to come back, but I do know that they need him. Um, they are, what did I say? They're 7-11 and 11 this season when he plays or when he doesn't play, and they're 12-9 and nine when he doesn't play. Like, that's 
that's the plan for you right there. If you can, if you can kind of keep up that 12 and nine pace when he's out there. And also if they solve the leg problems, he's not on a minutes restriction anymore. Like he's not going to be limited to 25 minutes a game. You can actually like keep him out there for 30 minutes because that's how good he's been. And you can have him closing games and he's been really good when he's done that. So I, I think that's going to be a real big key for them moving forward. Uh, again, even if he's able to play, um saturday i can't imagine that he would play sunday i don't think that they would want him playing back-to-backs at least not right now they're going to be careful with him as they should but they need him out there i like the part of our podcast adam where i read your writing to you and to our <laughs> audience it is hey, you remember it better than i do half the time no well i remember it and but, but then i also pull it up so i don't butcher it but but i think there are good nuggets in here and so i want to i want to share them i want to encourage people to go read it actually because you know our website and we want people to read our stuff and when, when we write it but if you just tune into the podcast i think these are good nuggets as adam mentioned winning record when he plays losing record when he doesn't but also the rockets are outscoring opponents this is from adam's piece on sports radio 610.com three biggest questions facing the rockets in the second half of the season they're outscoring opponents by 9.4 points per 100 possessions when he's on the floor which is, as Adam points out, by far the highest number of any rotation player. I think that's important. We're talking, And we're talking about offense, outscoring, okay? When he's off the floor, the Rockets are being outscored by two and a half points per 100 possessions. And their defensive rating drops drastically, okay? So I, I think those are things that you got to keep in mind. Um, I think we all understand, especially if we watch the Rockets, we all understand how important Tari Eason is. But when there's the frustration of a losing streak or a, a, a lull in the schedule where you're, you know, one and five on a road trip, almost zero and six on a road trip and almost lost to the worst team in basketball. You also got to think about how critical of a player you're missing on the floor. And and, and so I think that matters. Look, man, we, we, we got to get out of here. We're going to talk about the deadline at some point next week and we'll react to friday and saturday's games as they go into the second half of the season friday against the utah jazz uh saturday or i'm sorry is that right wait a minute yes yeah friday against the jazz no no saturday saturday Saturday, Saturday, jazz saturday Saturday, jazz yeah saturday jazz sunday celtics um so yeah so you know we'll, we'll react to those games and then also uh you know talk a little bit about what the rockets got going on ahead of the trade deadline which is what is that february 8th what yes. is it Fe- february 8th so uh so we got time to get into that and we will do so brandon scott adam spillane austin mendez handling things behind the scenes look y'all tell somebody about the podcast h-town hoops subscribe rate review tell a friend y'all be good